What up, Space Fam? Goes in here from Anime Up. We're back at it again to discuss the latest and craziest in the One Piece story. This chapter, we learn more about Shimotsuki Ushimaru, the great swordsman of Wano, who both looks and fights like Zoro. I gotta say, Wano is really turning out to be Zoro's arc, and since I love Zoro, I'm loving it as well. And we got much more happening too, so make sure to stay tuned for that. If you do enjoy seeing these One Piece reviews and want to keep them coming, channel the Pirate King with it and smash that like button with no mercy. Smashing the like button is Pirate King energy and not doing it is Orochi energy, so choose wisely. If you haven't, make this the video you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future One Piece videos. And while you wait for the next chapter to drop, feel free to check out my big and growing One Piece playlist that includes videos on all the Yonko, Warlords, Admirals, Mythical Zone users, and much more. Link to that is in the description. Now without further ado, let's jump into it, spoilers and all. On this week's cover of Shonen Jump, One Piece is dominating it in order to celebrate 100 volumes. Crazy to think how far One Piece has come and how good it is after so long. There is an amazing two-page cover spread that includes our Straw Hats along with other choice characters like Kid, Enel, Moria, and I love to see Boa there as well. Great image and Luffy and Zoro really look cool next to each other here. Still waiting on Moria to make an appearance in Wano in order to help carry out his long planned revenge against Kaido. The chapter itself is called Nobody Important which is just like the most ironic title ever and I love it but more on that when it's mentioned in context in the actual chapter. The chapter starts with Usopp giving us quite the performance as he excels at doing. There is Conqueror's hockey affecting a lot of men but notably not our boy Usopp. Usopp. Usopp takes advantage by saying that it can't be helped, it's natural for men with weak resolve to crumble before him. It would go more with Usopp's character to be playing off another person's Conqueror's Hockey than his own, but who knows, perhaps Usopp will actually turn out to have Conqueror's Hockey. His dad is definitely a legendary pirate, so it isn't out of the realm of possibility. Perhaps one day Usopp will make everything he pretends to be a reality, and that's his character arc. For now though, he keeps fibbing, saying he took down the two flying six members, and he calls himself Usohachi the Beast Hunter. It's hilarious how he's riding on top of a crocodile smile and how people respond to this. They freak out and Usopp offers them a chance to join him before he wipes them out. Speed is definitely of the opinion that the Conqueror's hockey present is a mere echo of Big Moms who's fighting on this floor. The Straw Hats start communicating with each other via snails. They are wondering what happened to Luffy but can't get a hold of him. The last update they got was when Momo assured him that Luffy was alright. I love Frankie's line that no news is probably good news. He's right, as we know, but I also love the optimism, while Nami is not having that answer at all. Frankie lets them know to come down because a bunch of enemies are trying to get to the live floor and they gotta defend it so that Zoro and Sanji can take the all-stars on in peace. You have the tendencies of worst generation captains rubbing off on their crews here, as Frankie lets them know what they gotta do, and Law's men insist that Frankie can't give them orders because they're in an equal alliance as if that's at all relevant in the midst of battle. It is significant though that not only does Luffy give the orders, his crew does too, solidifying how they're destined to become the Pirate King crew. In the meantime, on the third floor, there are out of control flames, so everyone is trying to escape to the live floor, and we see Brooke carrying Robin to safety, and now that we know Black Maria's bounty is 480 million berries, I have even more appreciation for how impressive Robin's victory was. We even get to see Jinbei, whom Brooke calls to ask for assistance. Of course, Jinbei isn't satisfied with just helping by taking out who's who, and he's already wondering what Kaido is up to. In this chapter, we are getting a lot of short moments about the updated positions for our characters. Kawamatsu is also shown as the samurai stand their ground to keep the enemy from interfering with Zoro and Sanji's battles. We then pop back to the fight against Kaido and Yamato. Yamato is clearly on the defensive while Kaido looks like he's enjoying himself, launching attacks like Thunderous Arrow for Yamato to block. Yamato is out of breath and finally says Kaido is trying to kill her. Yamato saying this means that although Kaido fought with her in the past, he was always holding back, but now it's different. And that makes sense because there's a big war going on. It's not just a random fight in the middle of an uneventful day. Yamato can't really be surprised by Kaido's actions here, especially since she's the one who insists on them fighting. Kaido obviously seems like a horrible father from what we've heard so far, but as a Yonko, he's been very lenient to Yamato as someone who's repeatedly challenged him over and over again for about two decades. 
he says as much saying that this isn't a family squabble anymore. Yamato should have been prepared for war and carrying Odin's name comes with a heavy burden. Of course Kaido is not playing around anymore and a lot of what he's saying makes sense. In the middle of a war you can't go around calling yourself by the name of a Yonko's enemy and challenge him and expect him to go easy on you. I'm playing devil's advocate here but we gotta remember that Kaido isn't just Yamato's dad, he's also the leader in one of the biggest wars we've seen in One Piece so far and will understandably act accordingly. Yamato barks back what's wrong with admiring Odin, since she was captivated by him. And that's when we get to the part that's the most interesting to me in this chapter. We get a flashback where the Oni princess, aka Yamato, has been throwing a non-stop tantrum for a week saying she's Odin. There must be some conflicting feelings going on for Kaido as a hurt kid Yamato asks for her daddy to let her out of the chains, while also insisting that she's Kozuki Odin. As as Kaido finds out, she knocked out the people around her and he deduces that she too has Conqueror's Hockey. It's really no surprise that Kaido was remarking that there's so many people at Conqueror's Hockey when Luffy, Kit, and Zoro came along. Yamato is hungry and begs for food while Kaido is thinking that if she insists on calling herself Odin, it would be better if she died, and this shocks her. At this point, Kaido might have thought it was a phase, but as we know, in the present it's been like two decades of this already and so it's not surprising that in the middle of a war, he's not holding back anymore. But back to the flashback, he puts Yamato in a cave and gives her a month to cool off and consider things. He puts her in a cave with so-called wild samurai, probably hoping that they'll antagonize her and help her get over calling herself the Samurai Odin. She cries as Kaido leaves her in the cave. Kaido also says that his words apply to the samurai present, saying he would like to have Wano's great swordsman serving under him as well. It's all a matter of one's will, and despite how strong Kaido is physically, it infuriates him that there are just wills, like his own daughters, that he cannot conquer. Kaido says that it's been days since the samurai have eaten, so he'll leave them a portion of food, expecting them to fight over like dogs. He even gives them samurai swords to use. Yamato cries out, as now the samurai can easily slice her up. She fears they'll resent her for being Kaido's child, and as she says she'll be killed, Kaido turns around and coldly mocks her, saying, but I thought you were Odin. For Kaido, she cannot be his daughter and Odin. Odin, but for her, she is both Odin and Kaido is also her father. The two aren't mutually exclusive. Back to the food and Yamato is crying and worried that the samurai are going to kill her first before they start fighting each other. But to her surprise, the Kyoshiro looking one gives the food to her saying, please eat and adding that samurai do not get hungry. I absolutely love the stoic code of the samurai from Wano. Rather than giving a reason to Yamato to stop acting like a samurai, their actions probably only solidify her resolve, and she cries as she eats and thinks samurai are amazing because they never get hungry, rather than knowing they're just well disciplined, even though they are feeling the pain like anyone else would. Then the one who looks like Zoro and is most likely Ushimaru Shimotsuki, Zoro's dad, or at least relative but probably dad, smiles with his face tilted upwards, just like Zoro would do, and says, and I quote, Eat up, you were born into quite the family, weren't you? She thanks the samurai, saying she will remember this bowl for the rest of her life. Yamato asks if she can become a samurai, and Ushimaru cuts her chains off, and he comments that she wants to be Odin, right? Saying that that man captivated all of them. Again, you have his eye being covered partially by the bandage except when he used the blade to cut the chains. Ryuma was one-eyed, now Zoro is one-eyed. That is definitely not a coincidence and there has to be some power associated with the closed eye among these Shimotsuki. Anyways, Yamato asks Ushimaru if he was friends with Odin and who the samurai are, but Ushimaru replies, how is a disgraced samurai meant to introduce himself? I'm nobody important. There's such a nothing happened vibe to that statement, and this moment along with the samurai don't get hungry moment gave me chills of awesomeness, partly because of how epic it was, but also partly because of how uncanny the similarities with Zoro are. It completely makes sense that such a cool character would come from such a cool samurai, and we all know at this point that Zoro has to have his origins from Wano. Even before all these Wano reveals, Oda said that Zoro would be Japanese in the real world, and obviously Wano is the Japan of One Piece. The internet's been going crazy over Zoro's probable father reveal since last chapter, and I'm so glad this chapter followed up by actually giving us significantly more to work with, including getting to actually see the character rather than just having people describe him as being similar to Zoro in appearance and sword fighting style. Eventually Yamato whips out Odin's logbook, 
book asking if the samurai could help her read it because it has lots of big words. And they go crazy over the fact that she has Odin's navigation log. Although interestingly enough, Ushimaru isn't shown losing his stoic expression, very Zoro-like indeed. Everything goes counter to Kaido's plan, as even the hole in the ceiling that's supposed to be how they scream that they give up is used as a light to read the book. It's like everything Kaido tried to do to get Yamato to change her mind only served to get her more committed to being Odin and being a samurai. After 10 days, the samurai start wondering if Kaido would really leave his child to die, remarking that if this keeps up, she's not going to see the battle that Odin predicted in 20 years. But she's sure that when the time comes, she'll fight for Wano, which is what's happening right now in the present. And then she'll go to sea and get much, much stronger. This is cool for multiple reasons. One, it strongly lends credence to Yamato a mythical zone user joining the Straw Hats, as many of us hope she will. Two, the story probably can't be close to over if Yamato and by extension the rest of the Straw Hats will keep getting much much stronger after the Battle of Wano. I absolutely love to see it. The samurai then decide that they'll contribute to the future by saving her, since 20 years is too long for their generation to wait. We even see Ushimaru carrying two swords rather than just one, another nod to Zoro, although the third sword isn't there. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we saw that Ryu Yuma used one sword, Ushimaru here added one, so he has two, and Zoro added the third one, so you get a really cool progression here. And you know what they say about the third one being the charm. Anyways, Ushimaru breaks through the giant boulder, the samurai agree that they can't sit there and starve like stray dogs, and they were never gonna yield, so may as well go down fighting. Now this gives Zoro an added significance here since he might be in a way avenging his father, and again I think it would be so cool if Zoro got to cut down Kaido in his dragon form because of how Ryuma slayed a dragon too, but we'll see. Right now I'm still glad that he's fighting King and we'll see if Luffy ends up needing a helping hand against Kaido after King is finished. Maybe Kaido tries to escape in his dragon form having lost to Luffy and Zoro cuts him then to keep him from escaping. Obviously that doesn't seem too likely now since Kaido is the strongest creature and I'm getting ahead of myself but I'm just trying to tie the history together with the present to create a kind of prophecy. Whatever happens I'm loving the Zoro attention. Back to the fight and Yamato says what right did Kaido have to steal her freedom and Wano's freedom? While Kaido the more mature one at 59 years old says there are no easy answers in this world. Adding that she's an immature brat. We see a clash of black lightning between two Conqueror's hockey users and two Mythical Zone users, and full props to Yamato for doing so well for so long. I don't think anyone expects her to win, but she's been amazing thus far and definitely played a very important role in delaying Kaido up until now. Luffy and Momo should be there any second at this point, so again, full props to her. And that is it for another epic chapter of One Piece. I absolutely loved it. As always, let me know what your favorite part was and what you look forward to seeing the most in the next chapter. Who was your MVP? For me, it was between Ushimaru and Yamato. Ushimaru didn't do much, but his presence was amazing and what he did do stole the show. On the other hand, Yamato, from a very young age, maintained her will and refused to submit to Kaido and finally did exactly what she'd planned to do for two decades and is now doing better than we could have expected her to do against Kaido, holding him up and doing an invaluable service for Wano and the Straw Hats. Absolutely legendary, both of them. If you did enjoy this review and want to keep them coming, you know what to do, channel the Pirate King within and smash that like button with no mercy. Smashing the like button is Pirate King energy and not doing so is Orochi energy, so choose wisely. If you haven't, make this the video you subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications or you will miss future One Piece videos. And while you wait for the next chapter to drop, feel free to check out my big and growing One Piece playlist that includes videos on all the Yonko, Warlords, Admirals, Mythical Zone users, and much more. Link to that is in the description. And I especially want to thank the patron squad over on Patreon and here on YouTube who help make videos like this one possible. First and foremost, I want to thank the patron of legend, the one acknowledged by Lord Twigo himself, Alpha Sigma, and are the one tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Ingrata, Pateha, Baal Jatal, Hinokami and Water, The Toasted Chi, The Spike, Corey McGowan, Dylan Isidore, Spidey Life Tanel, Tungsten Tarkus, Baked Buddhist, Cody Hebert, and Monkey D. Quilly. And our pro hero tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, the Red Haired Raven, Angel Cruz, Rithuan De Aura, Very Gucci, Alicia Actor, Bonnie Parks, Joanne Garcia, Ted No Ted, Fatboy Games, and Soul Rise Slice and Dice. Thank you all so much. If you do enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash anime uproar and becoming a patron today for as little as $1. If you do so, you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these amazing people 
people right here and you'll even get access to our private patron only discord where we talk about anime life and of course thank memes so check out patreon.com slash anime uproar link in the description if you are interested you can also join the youtube channel by clicking that blue join button next to the subscribe button that you've hopefully already destroyed so yeah you can support more content that way if you prefer and whichever way you support us you will get the same great benefits thanks again and until next time see ya space cowboys